is the morning of the 12th of April uh, 2021. And yeah, these are the Granddaddy Purples uh, autos. Last night I was looking at some of their uh, root structures. You know, you've got this, uh, hold on. There. Well, you can tear apart, yeah. So, I'm getting, uh, just open another one here. Another flap. The roots look all right. The, there's some yellow in the paper. Anyway, so I was looking through these and I checked out about 20 of them. And uh, yeah, almost all of them have roots at the bottom. So I'm going to be uh, transplanting, transplanting them out starting today, eight days earlier than intended because the root growth was so fast. Probably the, the bottom heat and the combination of like eight, nine hours of sunlight every day and then like 13, 14 hours plus of uh, lights. So yeah. I mean if they were uh, start, if these plants were started in smaller containers like a two ounce container and then moved up to a larger container they would have been larger than they are right now and maybe even if they were started in a larger container like a seven gallon they could have even been larger than they are right now but usually if you direct sow into a larger container uh, there's a slower growth at the start because there's so much time spent for the roots exploring before they finally start balancing it out with growth so anyway so uh, I just wanted to I'm not going to bring a whole tray down. I'm going to bring one plant down. I'm going to show you its journey all uh, all along its way to its new home. <clears throat> That's actually, I want to show off my tomato. That's a get stuff tomato. It's hardened. It's another get stuff tomato. I'm gonna show off the garden while I'm walking, hey? Well, one of the gardens. Alright, so <clears throat> what I'm doing right now is I'm showing you the path and the distance in real time within the same property that I lease uh, to the other area that I grow in. So I'm, uh, I'm walking towards a uh, field slash meadow which uh, has pretty much been fallow for 40 years, except a long time ago, the landlord ran some pigs there to clear the area. And uh, he brought in about 200 yards of uh, city topsoil. So there was a, a city project occurring and they were scraping topsoil off of some piece of land within city limits and all the topsoil got delivered out here to this property about 40 years ago and uh, it's just been growing with grass and trailing blackberries and uh, ferns on the outskirts and all sorts of stuff so this pond here you can see it's been getting dug a little bit every year when it dries out I uh, I take from that pond to, well actually that's that's the first pond, that's the, and it goes through the spillway down into the actual pond down there. That's the holding pond. This is what I water the plants with during the, oh, this is what I water the plants with during the um, growing season here. So this is a little bit of a, you know, garden orientation tour and uh, a little bit of uh, showing you the distance to bring these plants. So, right there, a piece of wood floats and attached to it is a hose. 
and that floating wood, this hose comes out. And by gravity it comes over here. And in this bathtub, a little float valve is set up to just cut it off once it gets full. So this just sits here year round and uh, whenever this tank, I just draw from this tank, right? I just, uh, I'll, I bring a 55 gallon drum right here and I use this pond water tank with bucket, five gallon bucket to fill the drum and make a compost tea and stir the compost tea up right here with a stick and then use a watering can to distribute the compost tea. Now this is the the meadow I was talking about. And these granddaddy purples are slated for the pots. So I'll be taking every granddaddy purple um, with sufficient root structure in the bottom so that the soil doesn't fall apart. I'll be clearing enough soil from the containers and parting enough so that a 20 ounce cup shape can fit into it. And after I've got all the containers prepped ready to receive these, that's what I'll be doing today, uh, then I'll be going up from where I was and I'll be making 11 trips up and down, bringing down uh, those 11 trays. I can carry two trays at a time, but I don't want to risk it. And if I had a help, uh, a helper, I'd be able to load everything up into like a large long tote and bring every, bring like everything down in fewer trips, maybe three three trips or something. Anyway, so you can see right now in the uh, in the pots, I've got uh, that's sh sugar and sweet sweet pea. It's a dwarf uh, sweet snap pea and uh, speckled red lettuce. Well, not red, so it's just called speckled lettuce, and it's a Mennonite variety. And so, you know... <clears throat> all of these pots, these living soil, uh, seven gallons. I mean, this is a five gallon here, but... Or it's actually a 4.4 gallon or something, but... And there's all these, uh... Living soil containers. So I'd say about a third of these I just made this year with, so they're not living soil, they're just mixed, reused super soil with compost and native soil all mixed in. But uh, this, uh, most of these seven gallons are two or three or four years old. Like these style seven gallons, all those ones, those are like old. And so, uh, they're quite heavy because I originally filled them Hugel style. So all these, not all of them, but most of these seven gallon pots were filled Hugel style. So like I fill the bottom 20% fifth, bottom fifth with woody material. And it's like substantially decomposed woody material. You know, I'll go into the depths of the forest and I'll look for really decomposed mossy logs. And if it's got a nice thick layer of moss, I like that. Moss is good aeration and moisture retention and water airspace it creates good airspace and also uh, um, anything that has mo a thick layer of moss growing on it has like decomposed long enough and that those woods are mostly spongy and really soaked and they've got all these holes in them from uh, insect activity and so they uh, they make really great like air and water res reservoirs so all these no most of these containers were filled with uh, Hugel style. So the bottom with like rottenly, spongy, porous wood. Right? I don't want hardwood, I don't want fresh wood, and I don't want just carbon, like just pithy, uh, the center of wood. I want like, basically when a log falls on the forest and it rots, it like rots from the inside out almost, and it's more likely to be like a hollow shell of bark and moss than it is to have the bark and moss decompose first and then be uh, a, a log of, you know, woody pith. So, um, you know, you the woody pith inside of a log or inside of a tree has three to five times less minerals or, or fewer minerals, I guess, than uh, the bark. So, you know, 
when you're harvesting wood for a hoogle installment, the higher ratio of bark to pith, the higher uh, concentration of mineral availability you're beginning the pile with from your wood content. Your wood content gives a certain... In that same space you could have pithy wood and uh, and it would just, you know, take longer to decompose and offer less to the soil. And that's kind of the big difference between wood chips and bark chips, or arborist chips and wood chips, is pure wood chips or sawdust, if you buy them from like a mill or, uh, or a supplier, they will usually have, uh, sorry I'm digressing about carbonaceous materials, but I just want to talk about this for a second. So um, if you buy wood chips or sawdust from a typical supplier, you'll end up having uh, uh, so much of the percentage of the uh, substance that you've purchased has been the centers of trees, the, the pith, and uh, it lacks that nutrition. And so in, in the case of like alder, alder sawdust is a popular, it breaks down very quickly. But when you have pith breaking down really quickly, you've got uh, lots of night, because there's so much surface area for alder sawdust, and alder sawdust is like, if you look at it under a microscope, the cells, in like the cellulose is further apart. So it's it's kind of like more space between the cells. So, you know, things like fungal, fungal hyphae can penetrate more easily, just because of the, uh, you know, genetic structure of how a alder grows or a poplar, that's another one that decomposes pretty quick. <sighs> Willow branches too. Anyway, so, um, if you have great surface area and the woody material is pith and the pithy woody material is from a species which has, you know, larger cell spacing, then you're setting yourself up for rapid decomposition of a mineral deplete carbonaceous material that's going to withdraw nitrogen from any any available source to speed its decomposition, break it down. And I'd really like to learn more about what the uh, what the actual chemical step-by-step -step process is that causes uh, wood to break down or carbon to break down from nitrogen. You know, I'd love to see a time lapse, for example, of a single wood chip being decomposed by a uh, you know. I don't know, like urea, foliar urea applications, you know, like soaked in urea repeatedly and see how it decomposes. Anyway, so um, <clears throat> the bottoms of these pots is filled with uh, woody forest stuff. So it has, you know, lichen, uh, mostly bark, a greater percentage of bark, which is more mineral content. Uh, and then the woody pith inside has been processed and turned to porous which gives all that habit habit space habitat space for uh for creatures to dwell in because that's what a living soil is the only difference between a living soil and a super soil that's called a living soil is uh, how much is living inside of it if you've just got microscopic things living inside of it well i guess that's living but it's you know, you're going to have microscopic life even in a in a sterile <laughs> recirculating you know deep water culture system like you're still going to have life in that system so w when it becomes a living system in my eyes is when the orders of life there's not just bacteria and there's not just fungi but there's protozoa feeding on the fungi and there's arthropods and flagellates and macrophages feeding all the way up the chain till you start to see a higher class of insects like uh you know beetles and um like pill bugs and stuff well i mean those are sh shredders decomposers and then you start to get you know mice and rats and birds and stuff and you know the last four or five years at this property uh i've noticed this year is just the most tremendous bird activity I've ever seen. Um, the birds are constantly ruining my malts. They're constantly pecking it apart and feeding on worms. So that's a good sign that the soil is is because uh, my my approach is I'm farming worms. Like the goal is to create areas 
where worms can habitate, and then to feed those worms at regular intervals and to insulate those worms from harsh conditions. So it's all about the mulch. Lots and lots of mulch, alternations of brown and green. So once I've got, there's just some more peas going. Yeah, every almost every one of these pots has some food planting in it, some lettuce. And so that's that's what I'm getting at. The whole point is that uh, <coughs> I fill these pots up, I layer them with, you know, woody material at the bottom, Hugel style, to create that habitat and that. Well, also I really like that it's uh, so easy. You know, they hold. There's so much organic matter in all these containers. They hold moisture a long time. You know, even in summer, when all these plants are in their mature stages of flowering and they're drinking as much and the heat is just beating down, I'm still only gonna have to water them every second day. So, which is good too, because I don't have much water in that pond over there. Anyway, so, um, yeah, the point is that filling all these pots, layering them hugel style, uh, after the woody material, I put in green material, whether it's like some seaweed or kelp or just some grass, like I'll literally just, while I'm making a pot, I'll just bend down and grab a handful of grass and just put that on top of, like in the pot. So, um, just, yeah, kind of just layering green and brown in the bottom uh, uh, 20, 30%. And then I move up to like a heavier, more clay-y, I'll use like a native soil in the next one, because I've got different pockets of native soil on this property. Um, one is a really big pile, probably only about 40 yards, but it's it's pretty big, and it's got uh, uh, it's all it's like a, it's more of that same city topsoil from 40 years ago, but it was just uh, some extra piled up in a different location instead of spread out here. So that uh, that that stuff is pretty infertile, and it was piled up by a tree, and so for 40 years that tree has been growing its roots into it, and like. I wouldn't say taking from it, but it this soil definitely does not have a lot of life in it. So that's it, to me, in my mind, it's kind of like the clay layer is what I get it for because it's it's a mostly clayey topsoil. It's pretty devoid of life, and it also has some pretty nasty rhizomes in it. So that's why I put it in the second layer. So bottom layer woody stuff, then the native, then the shitty native topsoil, and then the next layer I'll do like a. A really good native topsoil. Like I'll go to the you know forest, and I'll uh, get like a good handful of uh, you know good handful per pot of of black forest stuff that's found at the base of old maple leaf trees. You know, like a maple leaf tree that looks like it's uh, more than 50 years old. You know, I mean, I think in Cho's book he says look for something that's 150 years old or something. So you know, older is better, but. Uh, in my area, I found the oldest maple trees I can, and I don't know how to estimate their age very well. So, as far as I know, they're 60, 70 years-ish old, they look like it. Anyway, so, uh, you fill these pots up, and so since you're doing all this work to get things set up properly, and since the system works through, you know, root exudates, like the exchange, the light that come, the photons that come to the leaf get converted to different types of sugars depending on the plant species, which are delivered to the soil space, the rhizosphere, and that promotes different uh, populations of life to grow. Like, um, you know, if that was all corn, it would make all corn exudates and all the microbiology that likes corn exudates would live there. But if I have a few different plants in every pot, then that's a few different types of exudates and a more diverse uh, population of microbes can establish within the each individual ecosystem of each pot. And then from that point, while I'm cultivating my cannabis and I've got these companion plants, these short season, you know, 50, 60 day uh, companion plants, like lettuce is like 40 days, or that baby lettuce, 25. And uh, these uh, peas are only like 55 to 65 days. Um, and they're a bush variety, right? So uh, they don't need any uh, staking or training or anything. I just gotta pinch them and they'll bush out. So, uh, 
I have these living soil pods and it's going to benefit my cannabis tremendously to have these plants already in them. I mean, they've only been in them for a week, so it's April, you know, it's the beginning of the season. It's cold, it's the 49th parallel, like, I can only do so much with the cold, cold temperatures, but the, I'm trying as much as I can to put into practice the, the biological mechanisms I know which will be beneficial. So, one thing is, if you put cannabis into a pot that has nothing growing in it, there's no existing diversity from the multiple species that are contributing to it. If you put cannabis into a pot that already has had peas growing it, like those peas have been in there for like three weeks and that lettuce has been in there for about a week and a half. So like, it's not big enough yet, but once everything kind of... So I'll be planting these cannabis plants in there now and there's already, you know, you can imagine, use your imagination that within this area there are some uh, microbial populations of diversity which are different than the ones that are around there and much different than the barren area in the middle where the cannabis plant's going to go. So I'll be plugging my auto seed starts into these containers which have already have uh, crops growing in them harboring diversity even though it's short term and yes in practicality it likely has contributed nil or negligible amounts of uh, fertility in the theoretical way I'm outlining but once my cannabis plants are growing they're, they're, they're started indoors and they're they're nursed to a vigor and when I put them in they're not going to be competing you know that's what you don't want you don't want to have your cannabis plants slowed in growth because of your companion crops and you certainly don't want to be choosing companion crops that cause you to spend more time managing them than your actual cannabis so um, but you do also want to try to strike the balance of you know reaping some of these synergistic rewards and you know setting yourself setting yourself up to succeed that way and then also getting these uh, getting these uh, potential problems planned for and taken care of. So the solution is you, you grow the plants up and once there's this point where, you know, for like honestly with those peas, I probably will not get uh, pea pods, you know, because I know that once those plants get big enough to start producing pea pods, that's at a point where they're not going to be uh, favorable to what my cannabis plant needs. They're going to be demanding too much. Their root system will be uh, too well demanding. Yeah. So, but I do want to get some food out of it. So the idea is that I'll have my cannabis plants growing, and as they're growing bigger and they begin to shade things out, and there be begins to become competition, that's when I cut back the food crops as necessary, not more than necessary. Like the lettuce is a great one because you can peel the leaves out from the outside and leave the rosette in the middle and it will continue to grow and continue to pr provide exudates with the existing large root system it had when it was a larger plant. And so by not harvesting the whole head of lettuce and by leaving it in there in just a smaller form, you actually cause a disturbance in the balance between the foliage of the upper plant and the roots of the lower plant. and when the root system is five times bigger than the little foliage above, uh, those roots start dying off. And they also, at the same time, the root, as the roots are dying off um, and feeding the soil, they're also um, using any energy they can in that process to try to shoot out new growth. You know, so it's, it's tapping into a mechanism which pulls stored energy uh, more readily as a survival response than if you were to just, um, you know, cut the whole plant off and take it and not get that benefit or if you were to uh, just leave the plant growing and pick picking from it like uh, more modestly like just one or two leaves a day type of thing to continue on with a, a vegetative balance but in the context of companion planting with cannabis I'm looking to have plants established that are non-competitive and produce a food value and then while the cannabis is growing at the critical point which is only comes from experience with knowing different seed seed crops like I've grown speckled lettuce I've grown sugar and uh, dwarf snap peas for three years so like I know and I've and I've last year and the year before I had troubles with my peas companion peas um, competing with cannabis 
right? Because I wasn't on top of it. So I have, I've seen it, right? But now I know, now I'm really not going to let that happen because I know how big it gets. At what point, you know, at what point it's going to start affecting the cannabis plant next week is what I'm saying, right? So when I see the plant is, oh, it's this big, I know from last year and the year before that next week is when it will start impacting growth. So now is when I'll prune it back. And so for peas, they're great because you can get pea shoots. So I'll be pruning these all back and getting as much pea shoots as I can. And, uh, you know, they'll be used um, for salads or if they're too uh, woody and tough, I can just puree them or saute them. So uh, trying to improve the quality of my cannabis by having diversity of root exudates, trying to waken up the soil earlier and get microbiology going so that an exponential gain in momentum occurs when my cannabis plants do get plugged in. And uh, I'm trying to grow the cannabis as a priority without impeding its, its growth uh, or detracting any of my time, too much of my time or a substantial portion of my time from, uh, from maintenance of cover crops which I, I, I actually now call them co-crops, which includes both cover crops and companion plants. So I think co-crops is a great one because they're cooperative, they're companions, and they're covering the soil. So I now call everything co-crops because it doesn't matter if you're growing it to mow it down or you're growing it to till it up or you're growing it to plant beside it. It's always uh, co. It's providing a synergistic effect you desire. And that's the distinguishing difference between cultivar and weed, is when you desire the effect, it's a cultivar, and when we do not desire the effect, it's a weed. Which is why when I was managing that farm Ocala in Ontario, um, and we were dealing with all the lambs quarters weeds, it was a nightmare, <laughs> which surprised us one day when a tour bus of 20 Chinese people came by, and they were excited that we were weeding all these lambs quarters and didn't need them because at that they were only at like the third or fourth node of development and at that young stage of growth it's considered a delicacy it's a it's like a spinach like substitute in a lot of uh, uh oriental cuisine so i was uh blown away when this when i had been weeding this uh and dealing with you know because it's 50 acres with 32 in production and I was, we, you know, dealing with strategies to weed this lamb's quarters, which is a notorious Western Canadian, you know, weed, and it's all through the prairies and the East Coast too, apparently. But here I am struggling to figure out how to deal with this at scale. You know, I'm trying scything to, you know, check out the time, see if I can get that done. I'm trying, uh, you know, mowing, and uh, all of a sudden these. These tourists come by to visit the, the vineyard, and uh, they spend the afternoon picking a bag of veggies each. They didn't do much, but it you know, made me think. To them, it's a cultivar. They, they plant these seeds, and they grow fields of it, and they harvest it, and they sell it at markets. And to us, it's just a weed, and we're getting a really thick, gorgeous stand of this weed that's a problem to us, but it's really like a, a prime, like perfect condition cash crop to, to them. So... Uh, yeah, there is no such thing as a weed or a cultivar. Those are just our shorthand, just like there's no such thing as all of the human invented things we have. It's just the things we call them don't exist. The things they are exist, but it's our under misunderstanding of their nature and our need to explain it in a, in a single word that causes a scenario where we're always saying things are what they're not. But, uh, yeah, so I think there's 70 pots here, 69, 70 pots. And so they're going to get loaded up. I've got 170, 80 granddaddy purples that are coming down. Um, and you can see, too, on the hoogle on the top there, I've got some peas planted. But that hoogle, all three of the hoogles will be receiving granddaddy purple as well. I've got some of these larger in-ground planting sites. Uh, what I'm thinking is I'm putting the amethyst hammer in these hoogles. 